Hi everyone, this is Heather Lawton and from the Flourish Academy, I'm joined by my good friend and co-host Mara Chick. Hey Mara. Hello. All right, so we're diving back into Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway by Susan Jeffers. And in our PhD. La- PhD. <laughs> and in our last episode, what did we end with? Mara? Okay, so, you know, I want you guys to know that these actionable strategies, like, we do them as well. Like, they're things we have personally done in our life and in, in business to kind of, like, take us to the next level. So we do this too. So we're going to share with you, we asked everyone to like write down their three fears, three biggest fears and like what's one action you can take towards that fear. And I thought it would be really great. (laughs) Fun. Heather, (laughs) I Heather fun for Heather's. This is not fun, but um, I thought it would be really great if we just kind of shared our fears, the three fears that we came up with, um, with our listeners so that they could kind of see that we go through this stuff too. You know, we're not immune. Yeah. Yeah, Um, So I'll go first and uh, we'll alternate here but um so as i was going through this my my first fear was a fear of death um and i just told heather this story when i was very young like seven or eight um i was afraid of dying i i don't know where that fear came from I, i don't recall anyone dying at that time um but i would get so upset thinking like oh gosh like i'm just gone so Everyone it's fear else move on. Dying, of yes. you dying. Yeah. And like what like the world keeps spinning, but where where do I go? What do I, I and I used to get so afraid. I told my mom once, and you know, she would comfort me like, you know, mom does. And then the next time I'd go to her and I would just look at her and I would be sad and I would just point my finger up, like upwards, and she would know exactly what I meant that I was afraid of dying. And, um, she would just cuddle me for hours until I felt better. And, um, I'm still afraid of death, but dealing with my mother's death has lessened that fear quite a bit, uh, because I know she's waiting for me. Right. Um, and I am very excited to be reunited with her, but I really have this fear of just, sudden death, which is what I'm actually experiencing with my mother, which is like, I used to always worry like, oh, I'm gonna have a brain aneurysm, like, and I'm just gone one day, they're gone the next. And then here I am, my mom died of a brain aneurysm. So this is very strange to me. But yeah, so I have a, a huge fear of, of death. And I'm learning how to deal with it by grieving my mother. Wow. And, you know, to take this one step further, what is, you know, we said, Part of the strategies were name the fear. And then what's one action you can take to overcome this fear? What could you possibly do to, you know, like what's... I am going to read a book on death and dying. Okay. All right. right. Um, and, you know, I'm a Christian. I do believe in Jesus and I know they're waiting for me and I'm... I get it. But it still is very feel fearful for, for me. So I'm going to read death and death and dying books. That sounds like a riot. <laughs> Doesn't it sound like it is going to just push me over the edge? Probably. <laughs> I'll be like, well, that wasn't a good idea, but wow. I'll but start there. Do? I'll start there. Well, how do you inocul- right. in- inoculate yourself to that kind of fear? Right. I don't know. So I'll start with books. So okay. what's your first fear? Okay, Heather? My first fear, since we're going super deep is, uh, <laughs> Snakes. I'm afraid of snakes. Well, snakes are kind of gross. And I hate they snakes. They like slither. Yeah. <gasps> They're so sneaky. They're so sneaky. And they just remind me of Satan. So I hate snakes. I don't want anything to do with them. I'm not sure how to get over this fear because I just cannot see myself exposing myself to snakes. Now, we live in the woods. So there are snakes There's here. snakes everywhere. Yes. And well, and one time one tried to kill me. So, I mean, I'm pretty sure. So I was coming into the garage and there was this snake under the steps in my garage and it reared up at me and it just had the look in its eyes of death. Like it was coming. So I screamed and we got rid of the snake, but, um, we, not we, you didn't, you didn't, didn't have any part of that. Of Actually, I videoed all of this. Okay. Yes. I, I was out of my mind. I just literally nothing bothers me. Spiders, bugs, creepy, crawly things, nothing. I just cannot stand snakes. All right. What are you going to do? I don't know. Why don't you find like a snake skin and start touching a snake skin? <gasps> you just, that gave me chills. No, like, you know, when they yes, shed their skin. Yes. But why would one do that? To get over the fear. 
I, What's your risk? You're going to have to take a risk. Actually, there are, um, we have trails on our property that we walk and hike on. And on one trail, I actually know where there's a snake skin hanging from a tree. Okay, you're going to go grab it. And I want a video. My gosh. What if I die? And then what? You are then not what? going to die. That's what you say to me all the time. You're not going to die, Mara. <laughs> okay, so snakes. I'm, okay. I need, obviously, I need to expose myself to snakes. Okay. Nice ones. Nice ones. I don't know any of nice snakes, but okay. okay. All right. What's your second <laughs> um, one? My second fear. So we went from death to snakes now to another very deep one for me. And I, I actually can't believe I'm sharing this, but um, I have a fear of having an unfulfilling marriage. Wow. That is pretty deep. Yeah. There- and I, I love my husband. Tony is the sweetest, most caring, kind, gentle, like loving man. Um, but he suffers from clinical depression. So it's very difficult sometimes. Um, you know, and I think I've shared this on the podcast before, but, you know, a switch just turns off in him and uh, it makes it hard for us to live our lives mm-hmm. because he just doesn't have drive to do anything or, you know, be a husband to me it's more like we're cohabitants yeah. we're roommates yeah, <laughs> um, or I'm his mother yeah. and I'm reminding him to take out the trash and clean the dishes and clean his room and so I really start to fear having an unfulfilling marriage because I just feel like being with someone is all about you know having that connection and commitment and partnership partnership and um sometimes we really lack that and it's worrisome to me so I think, um, I mean, I could share more, but I don't know that it's appropriate yeah. for the but podcast. What's, what's but one thing that one you thing, could do? Um, I am going to take my husband on a date. Oh, okay, good. So you just make it happen. I'll just, just make, make it. I'll happen. try to make it yeah. happen. I, Because I, I can't fix his depression. You know, it's just something we're going to have to learn to live with. Uh, so... I'll just try to date him a little bit more and try to keep my mouth shut when he burps and farts and sneezes and <laughs> makes all those noises that I hate. He's a loud eater too. Oh, geez. Oh, that's man. A, that's actually a problem for me. I, I have a real condition. And I'm like, please stop. <laughs> you sound like a horse. And he's like, how do you know what a horse sounds like? I'm, I, I, because I'm listening I to I have it. been to horses and I, I, like, that's a horse. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to work on dating him. A little bit more because you know it's not, to make it happen it's going to be up to you yeah so i can't that's hard i don't rely on other people like i take control of my life and i'm responsible for everything so and that includes my marriage even if i can't control his depression i can control my reaction to his wow. depression so um i will work on that that's taken a lot of growth and time hasn't it to yes. get to that point yeah Good for you the first time his depression came out i was like i'm out this is not uh-uh what is this you're not working you're not doing anything like i love you but right this isn't who i married yes. so it was we got to know each other on a whole different level you know like who's because tony is tony and then there's depressed tony and oh. they're two very different people and um, Tony, that wasn't depressed, is the one who said, let's start a photography business. And here I am now. He doesn't even do anything with the business anymore. You, you, but you I am, yeah. you know, I'm thankful that I had him because he was the one that suggested right. it. So anyway. Okay. Great. Okay. Your second right. fear. My second fear is heights. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I, uh, I have a problem with heights. I, I mentioned in the last episode that I did not know this. I was on a ride at Hershey Park, and I was like, whoa, I'm feeling kind of funny. Um, I love roller coasters, so those don't bother me. But just to go up high and sit and look out or be on the edge of something um, just causes a physical reaction in me that I actually didn't know I had. I did not know that I was afraid of heights. So obviously, the way to overcome that is to expose myself to it uh, safely. <laughs> <laughs> With a safety <laughs> harness. They'll push you off the yeah, ledge of something. Right. No. Um, I don't, that's not a, it's not like a huge deal in that. It doesn't hold me back from living my life, mm-hmm. you know, but. There aren't many situations where you're. No, I don't find myself, high. you know, having issues with this, but I could expose myself to it more and just. What if you went and stood on top of like a parking garage or something? Yeah, I would be okay. To... I would be okay there. Okay. I think it's, um. Um, you know how they have in it's some like, cities those glass floors or um, edges that you yes. go up? I think there's one in maybe Chicago that you yes, go up really high. You, yeah. Okay, never. I could not do that because it's like a glass bottom. In, in fact, if someone posts a photo of that, I can feel the reaction in my body, which is so bizarre because I 
this is within the last, I don't know, five or so years that I discovered this. Isn't that strange? This is weird. Yeah, I don't know where it came from, but um, I don't like it. <laughs> so I have to figure out a way to get over it. Again, it's not holding me back in my life. There are fears that are obviously rank a little bit higher, like a few of yours thus far, <laughs> are a little more impactful to your livelihood in your life than Well, types. the one thing you should know about me is I'm not a surface level person. Yeah, like I like to deep. dig in yeah. deep and when yeah. things get hard, Mara leans in because yeah. I don't. Yeah, you do. You do. So, okay, we'll work on that okay, heights thank thing you. with some skydiving. Okay, number three. <laughs> she did not like that no, idea. No, no. <laughs> um, my third fear Um and this is something I, I actually didn't know um, I feared. So one of the things I do in like my self-love life coaching is, you know, how to like get in touch with like your inner wisdom and let your heart lead instead of your mind because your mind can override your thinking and mm. you start to question yourself and like, oh, you don't fear that. You're fine with that. You know how to do this. And so um, my heart said that I am afraid that I lack the knowledge and experience to help the women that are put in front of me. So I think I have a fear of inadequacy. Right. But in my mind, I know that like I have the knowledge, I have the experience. I've been through a lot of stuff in my life and I've overcome it. I've built two great businesses here and I'm, I have it. It's just, I feel like I don't know enough or I'm not ready. And I just kind of hold myself back a little bit on that because I have this fear of being inadequate and I want to transform lives for women and, and, um, but I can't transform them. They have to transform themselves. I can just give them the tools to do that and the means and the methods. So, um, it's, I'm learning on how to kind of overcome that. So I'm just going to step out a little further and kind of put myself out there with, uh, you know, what I'm learning and some of the ideas that I have them afraid to put out there, because what if they don't have an impact that oh, right. I want them to have? Right. So, um, and one of those was an online course in like self-discovery. So I think I'm going to start working on putting that together. Good. And, That's the one thing you can do yeah. is just dive into it. Yeah. Okay. Good. That's great. Yeah. Okay. What's yours? This is hard. So, um, I sat down and was thinking of my fears and I was thinking, you know, the snakes and the heights and I really couldn't come up with anything very deep. And then it hit me. It hit me really hard. A ton of bricks, babe. Like square in my face. It's Craig. If something happens to Craig, I just don't know how I would deal with that. He is everything. And I, 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 I can't even think about it. I can't. Obviously, I'm having trouble articulating yes. it, but we have a wonderful marriage. We've been married almost 20 years. We've been together 24, and I am so, so, so blessed with a husband, as wonderful as he is, that I just can't fathom life without him. So that's, I would say, my my deep-rooted, serious fear has to do with him. And I really, I really struggled to think of anything else that I feared. But man, when, when you and I were talking prior to the episode and that hit me, I had a hard time, obviously. <laughs> and it's okay. Like you love someone so much. God gave you a great partner, Heather. And it, it means a lot to know that you love someone that much that like you feel like you don't know what would happen if you lost that person. And that's okay. I know you believe in Jesus. Jesus is your BFF, I always <laughs> say. And I know you know that like you guys will spend eternity together, but um, it's okay to have that fear. I'm really proud of you for putting that out there. I know because you looked at me and you're like, I can't do it. I can't, I can't say that. And I'm like, yes, you can. You need to say it because this is what I'm learning. So these fears, because we talk a lot about this in my self-love stuff, these fears are in us. Like they are there eating away at us mm. inside. Okay. But we are so afraid to admit them because we're like, well, 
I don't want that. I don't want that known, but we already know it. And just putting it out there helps us move forward and process it because the first step is always acknowledging that it exists. You're right. You're right. And you can't just, it's not one thing to just say in your head, like, oh yeah, I'm afraid of something happening, happening to Craig because it doesn't mean anything. But when you vocalize it to somebody else, that is a huge step in working towards overcoming your fear. Wow. Because it just made it real. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm You're right. I know. That's you. very, thank you. That That's very, I think, poignant of you to say that acknowledging it and admitting that that's what it is, that at least giving it light will help you to move forward in a better direction. But I honestly don't know what one step I could take to get over that is. And I don't know that either. Right. Um, because I think you're always, even if you did, I think you would always be afraid of it. It'll always be. It's in the, in the back of your mind. And that's okay. So I think your step is just to enjoy every minute you guys have together at this. I mean, nothing's wrong with Craig. (laughs) FYI, like Craig is perfectly healthy and fine. But I think you just, you know, and you know this, nothing. And as we've been dealing with my mother and, you know, we're not promised tomorrow. So we're going to live our best life today. So I think as long as you do that, then you've done a great job, Heather. Oh, and I thank you. you have anything to fear. And listen, trust me, sister. We're living every day to the fullest I here. Know, I know you are. <laughs> Heather loves to share information about her marriage with me. And I'm like, okay, whatever. It's perfect. So. But thank you for talking me through that and bringing it out. Uh, I hope that this helps our listeners, that someone hears this, our fears, both our deep ones and my silly ones, <laughs> and thinks, you know, that they're not alone mm-hmm. and that there are ways to overcome these things. But you have to admit it first. You have to face what it is you're, you fear, um, either by writing it down so you can physically look at it on paper or by sharing it with a close friend or family member. Mm-hmm. So you can say, hey, listen, this is where I'm at with fear. And I just need to acknowledge it so that it can maybe lessen, not go away, but maybe lessen. I love this, this part about coaching and particularly I'm like the self-love coaching that I'm doing is like getting these things out in the open and shining light on them oh, first because step. First when step. it's so deep and dark inside, you're like, you'll never be able to face it. It's scary. So when it's dark. It's growth. Growth yeah. is going to happen. Heather. And growth oh. and growth is pain. <laughs> it is. <laughs> and struggle. The truth. Um, okay. So let's try to jump into chapter three. Are you ready? I am. Um, we're going to get right back into feel the fear and do it anyway. <clears throat> so Chapter three, page 25. Heather, do you want to take it from there? Yeah, it's from pain to power. And she says, if everybody feels fear when approaching something totally new in life, yet so many are out there doing it despite the fear, then we must conclude that fear is not the problem. Obviously, the real issue has nothing to do with fear itself, but rather how we hold the fear. For some, the fear is totally irrelevant and for others it creates a state of paralysis so it depends on how you view it it's not the fear it's the story or the emotion that you Mm -hmm. assign to it so if i assign death to snakes (laughs) then of course i'm going to be afraid but to someone else like someone who has a pet snake that loves them, they obviously don't assign that same story to the snake. So it's not the fear. Mm-hmm. It's how I am interpreting the fear. Yes. And your feelings are not the truth. Like it's not right. the truth about the situation. It's just your reaction to something that's happening. Correct. So yes. Anything on page 26 before I dive into 27? No, you go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So on page 27, Susan says this a self assured woman who is in control of her life draws like a magnet. She is so filled with positive energy that people want to be around her. Yet it is only when she has become powerful within herself that she can become authentic and loving to those around her. The truth is that love and power go together. With power, one can really begin to open the heart. With no power, love is distorted. Which I think we're self-assured women who are in control of our lives. I feel that we are. I think we are. And I think we have love and power that do go together. So I just wanted to let you know that about yourself. But thank you. And you too. But we know, both of us know that a lot of women struggle with this. And in the book, she says, you might need to say to yourself 25 times each morning, Mm -hmm. noon, and night, I am powerful and I am loved. Out loud right now, if this Mm -hmm. is something you struggle with, you need to say, I am powerful and I am loved. Even if you don't say it or don't believe it. Right. Say Say it it. because... 
it'll start to become the truth for you. It absolutely will. Okay, Heather, take us to page 31. Oh my gosh. This is one of our favorite. This is my favorite area in the book where she's talking about words and why they are so important and how important it is to reframe. So for instance, um, you take yourself, again, the title of the chapter is From Pain to Power. So saying something like, I can't, you can reframe that to I won't. Mm -hmm. Because if you can't, that's painful. You don't have control. But if you say I won't, that means you have control and you're, you have the power. Uh, don't say I hope, say I know. Don't say mm-hmm. if only, say next time. Don't say it's terrible, say it's a learning experience. She goes on to say, I can't implies that you have no control over your life, whereas I won't puts a situation in the realm of choice. From this moment on, strike I can't from your vocabulary. When you give your subconscious the message I can't, your subconscious really believes you and registers on its computer. Weak, weak, Mm. weak. Your subconscious believes only what it hears, not what is true. You might be saying I can't simply to get out of a dinner invitation, such as I can't come to dinner tonight. I have to prepare for tomorrow's meeting, but your subconscious is registering weak, 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 weak. <laughs> I hear like my Navy SEALs in a week yeah. is weak. In fact, I can't come to dinner is an untruth. The truth is I can come to dinner, but I am choosing to do something mm-hmm. that has a higher priority at this moment. But remember, the subconscious can't discern the difference and is still registering weak, weak, weak. So lies make you weak. Stop lying to everyone in your life saying you can't do something. That is a lie. You can. You are just choosing Choosing. not to. And that's fine because you are an adult and you can make those choices. Mm -hmm. But you really do need to strike I can't from your vocabulary and tell the truth. I won't. I won't because I don't, because, and she goes on to say, you could say, I'd love to come to dinner, but I have a meeting tomorrow that's important to me. I'll feel better walking in totally prepared. So I will pass for tonight and hope you'll invite me again. Because this statement has truth, integrity, and power. The subconscious hears you stating your priorities with clarity and choosing the outcome that serves your own growth. Choosing this way doesn't leave you the helpless victim of your meeting. Wow. Wow. That's pretty powerful, those words. Um, she talks about, she has a couple other examples here, but um, she says, I want to say, it's a problem is another deadening phrase. It's heavy and negative. It's an opportunity opens the door to growth. Each time you see the gift in life's obstacles, you can handle difficult situations in a rewarding way. Each time you have the opportunity to stretch your capacity to handle the world, the more powerful you become. She also says, if only is boring. You can hear the whine behind it. Next time implies that you have learned from the situation and will put the learning to use another time. Jeez, oh man. Also, it's terrible. It's terrible as bandied, bandied, oh my gosh. Bandied. (laughs) Bandied around in the most inappropriate circumstances. For example, I lost my wallet. Isn't that terrible? What's so terrible about losing a wallet? It's certainly an inconvenience, but it's hardly terrible. I gained two pounds. Isn't that terrible? It's hardly terrible to gain two pounds. Yet that's the way we talk about trivia in our lives. And our subconscious is registering disaster, disaster, disaster. Replace it's terrible with it's a learning experience. Mm-hmm. We've got we've got to watch this in our own lives. I don't think we, we do it very often. No. But I, I know periodically we'll get dramatic about something. I know <laughs> I will. This is awful. This is terrible. What a nightmare. Um... Okay, it's not. like. Okay, you know what's terrible? Losing your mother. That, that's Suddenly. Right. That, is terrible. that is terrible. But someone, something, your photo's missing, or, oh, your package didn't get shipped on time. That's not terrible. Or your car won't start. I'm sorry. Not it's the unfortunate end of the world. circumstance. Yeah, but, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. But stop blowing it up to it's terrible. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Anything from thirty page 35 you want to add, Heather, before um, I move to... Yeah, closing and strategy. Yeah, the the whole page. The whole thing. Um, She says, maybe these semantic differences seem trivial, but I assure you they are not. Mm -hmm. There is power in the tongue. And also she goes on to say, take one risk per day, small or bold, that will make you feel great once you've done it. And I like that. Take a risk per day. Yes. 
Um, she goes on to say on page 36, with each risk you take, each time you move out of what feels comfortable, you become more powerful. Your whole life expands to take in more of what there is in this world to experience. As your power builds, so does your confidence. So that stretching your comfort zone becomes easier and easier despite any fear you may be experiencing. The magnitude of the risks you take also expands. Whether if feels like it or not, you already have more power than you could ever have imagined. We all have. When I speak of going from pain to power, I am not talking about pulling the power in from any outside source. Inside of you, just waiting to emerge is an incredible source of energy, which is more than sufficient for you to create a joyful and satisfying life. It isn't magic. It is only a process of tapping the energy already there, though you are not aware of it. We all have the power. We all have it in us. We do. It's just about pulling it out and this book is really going to help us okay strategy ready um okay before you go to bed each night i want you to define the risk you're going to take the following day good idea okay define it the night before awesome heather how can everyone support our podcast hey make sure you subscribe share with your friends like comment leave a review and that would be great awesome thanks everyone for listening we'll catch you next time on the flourish academy podcast